For most of us, the circus conjures up images of fun, excitement, and wonder. The Big Top seems to have it all, food, music, and thrilling entertainment that includes death-defying acts of acrobatics and skill, some of which even include wild animals. But how often, in the midst of our amazement and wonder, do we ask ourselves about the price the animals have paid to be included in these shows? For humans, joining the circus requires skill, talent, and a spirit of adventure. But for animals, joining the circus requires a great deal of sacrifice. Sacrifice that they do not choose, but that we choose on their behalf. In the late 18th century, when the only circus animals were horses, Englishman Philip Astley added tumblers, acrobats, jugglers, and clowns to fill in the time when he was not performing riding tricks, and thus became one of the founders of the modern circus. After John Bill Ricketts brought the circus to America, traveling circuses became extremely popular in an era when an escape from the drudgery of farm and factory work was welcomed by the masses. Masses who did not have the distractions of radio, television, and the internet. But just like the public of today, the attendees were always hungry for something new. Once an act had made the same circuit a couple of times, the audiences got bored. The onus was on the ringmaster to come up with bigger chills and greater thrills. Their answer was wild animals. At first, they were simply part of privately owned menageries that were brought along for display only and were not really part of the circus acts at all. They were even billed separately, as in the phrase, museum, menagerie, and circus. It would not be long, however, until audiences needed something more than to just look at animals in cages. After all, they could do that in a zoo. In 1833, Isaac A. Van Amberg entered into a cage with big cats and is thus considered to be the first wild animal trainer in American circus history. How many of us really take the time to consider what training a wild animal really means? What does it take to make a 12,000 pound elephant agree to balance on one leg atop a pedestal? What does it take to make a 500 pound tiger sit on its hind legs on a platform on top of a horse? What does it take for predator and prey to deny all natural instinctual behaviors and wait passively for commands inside of a ring? Many say that what it takes is brutality, the breaking of an animal's spirit so that the animal is not aware of its own strength. They say we must use bull hooks and pitchforks to show them who's boss. Others argue that training is a series of positive and loving reinforcements in which a bond is formed between the animal and the trainer. But the manner of training is really only just one small part of the issue. In the world of entertainment, where an act either brings in the money or ships out, the animals involved are simply a commodity, an investment, a thing to be used today and discarded tomorrow. For every performing lion or tiger that entertains the public, 30 lions and tigers are destroyed because they simply do not have the right look or the right temperament for training. The so-called bonding process that occurs between animal and trainer is only the result of removing cubs from their mothers months or years before they would wean themselves in the wild so that the cubs will behave more submissively to humans. After an individual animal lives past its usefulness to people, it will often be sold to the highest bidder with little regard as to the intention or the integrity of the buyer, who may be a taxidermist, a canned hunt ranch owner, or a trader of animal parts in the illegal Asian market. Animals bred for entertaining circus goers come from generations of creatures who long ago, unwittingly and unwillingly, traded life in the wild for life on the road. For people, life on the road involves extreme weather, long hours of travel, and few breaks. But for animals, it also involves metal trailers, barred cages, 
concrete floors, and quite literally, whips and chains. A far cry from the grasses of the African savanna, generations have never known anything that might actually feel like home. The call to remove animals from circus acts is not an exercise in deciding whether a trainer's methods are kind. It is an exercise in restoring perspective, in seeing these animals as they really are. No animal trainer in his right mind would attempt to train a wild lion in the lion's own habitat, in the lion's own world. That we forced these animals to come into our world does not change their nature. It only breaks their spirits. It does not tell us who or what they really are. It only tells us who they are when they are being dominated by somebody else. We may not see the strings, but they are still only puppets. We do not get to the heart of the matter by analyzing the type of captivity in which a wild animal lives. We get to the heart of the matter by asking ourselves where a wild animal really belongs. Please do not support acts that force animals to perform, even if the manner of force was gentle. Those who really love wild animals want only one thing, to give those animals enough room to be who they are in the places in which they truly fit in, in their native habitats, in their own world. Is this really too much to ask? You can help change the way people treat big cats by texting the word TIGER to 20222.